Welcome to the eighth annual CPAC. My name is Walter Cruttenden and I'll be your host. But uh, the real people that did the work are Sandy and Debbie and Sean and Gary and uh, half a dozen that I'm not remembering right now, Filiberto. And um, uh, if you uh, need anything, uh, they can help you out. I know that many of you have come a long distance, uh, some from across the country and some, a few from other countries overseas. And so uh, just, um, you know, we extend the warmest welcome to you and please let us know if there's anything we can do to help. Um, a couple other just little administrative things. We're trying not to use these doors to go out, so if you could use the back doors uh, in between the talks, that would be great. And there's um, a Q&A period that will take place after each of the talks, but sometimes the speakers run a little bit over. So if we don't have uh, time for Q&A immediately after the talk, there will be a panel at the very end where you can ask questions and answers. And of course, uh, you can always ask uh, any of the speakers during the breaks. There'll also be a, a time to sign books and, and um, uh, meet the authors in case you don't get a chance to during one of the meals or breaks. And, and um, I believe that's on the schedule, or if not, ask Sandy. So I think that's the administrative stuff. Ancient cultures around the world spoke of this incredibly a vast period of time with alternating dark and golden ages, something that Plato called the Great Year. And different countries uh, referred to it in different ways. Uh, in, in the Indian culture, they call it the Yuga Cycle. Uh, in the Mayan culture, you read about their, their different suns. The Hopis call it different worlds. Some uh, cultures just simply referred to this uh, procession of the equinox as a way that uh, we see the changing ages as the equinox moves through the different constellations of the zodiac. And this was long thought to be uh, just a myth, and I think uh, um, in most academic circles it probably is still thought to be a myth, and so we weren't really taught much about it in school. But most of the uh, researchers and authors that are here and will be speaking over the next few days uh, have some suspicion that perhaps our histories of the world aren't exactly correct. And so uh, it started with just a few, you know, people like John Anthony West and Robert Schock and Graham Hancock uh, sort of questioning the, uh, the status quo. And it's really grown into uh, a quite a movement out there now where a lot of people think that uh, uh, maybe there is uh, something to this idea that the ancients knew something that we don't. And so uh, we're, uh, we have this informal collaboration going on uh, between many of these alternative historians and it's, it's just a whole lot of fun. And so most of the speakers uh, here today will have a book available and it gets into their particular line of work and as you probably know, we're looking at this whole idea uh, through archaeology, anthropology, uh, linguistics, astronomy, uh, basically uh, using all the different sciences we can, mythology, uh, studying ancient stories, to try to better understand what the ancients knew. And so my talk today is, is going to look uh, a little bit at the mythology side of things. Um, we, we've read a lot about uh, mythology uh, uh, from Joseph Campbell, and he had a couple interesting quotes. He said uh, that uh, myth predates all other forms of communication. Uh, universal images and archetypal wisdom is embedded in myth. And he said, myths resemble each other as dialects of a single language. And this fits really nice with uh, some of the things that uh, the great saints and sages talk about. Uh, uh, Sri Yukteswar and Yogananda and, and others, they mentioned that there was a pre-Babel time on this earth when mankind 
uh, spoke with one tongue. And uh, I think our best evidence of, of this time uh, comes to us through myths. And al almost every culture of kind of myths, and most of them were passed down verbally, and you know they went through the dark ages, so some of them aren't too clear. Uh, but you do find some recurring themes in these myths, and so that's uh, one thing we're going to talk about. And my particular talk uh, today is is on uh, one of my favorite books of all time. Oh, this will just get you oriented where we're going here today. So one of the oldest myths in the world is this Greek myth of invariance, you know, where we, uh, the, the one and the many, I'm sure you've heard of this, they're all trying to figure out where things came from and they pretty much uh, discern that things came from the one. And uh, it's so interesting today that modern scientists are are really working on the same idea, you know, when you, when you think about um, the, the work going on at CERN or uh, physicists uh, looking at the idea of this Big Bang, you know, we're really trying to figure out uh, how the many came from the one. And so uh, that is a theme that we'll, we'll find in, in these myths in this book called Hamlet's Mill. So, Hamlet's Mill is, uh, is a book that really, really uh, personally moved me. Um, it's a pretty dense book. Uh, when, I, when I first read it, uh, I'm not sure that I got very much of it. I probably still don't. Um, but it's, uh, it has myths from about 40 different cultures. And about 30 of these cultures talked about the procession of the equinox, uh, this idea that there are these changing ages, there's this alternative, uh, alternating dark and golden ages. And uh, that's, that's what's so uh, unique about this book. And it does go into many other myths too, but this seems to be a recurring theme. And so um, it's interesting, here we are in the 21st century, and you wonder why that, uh, you know, this book is uh, written in the 60s, it's, it's really just uh, the beginning of looking at uh, myth as a science. And it, it really hasn't been followed up on uh, since the 60s. It was kind of uh, uh, criticized quite a bit by modern scholars because it, it brought into question uh, what we knew. And, uh, but today I think the book is selling more than it used to sell about 50 years ago. So let's... Uh, get into it here and I'll tell you a little bit about the authors. The book is written by Giorgio de Santiana and Hertha von Deschen, uh, two brilliant scholars. Giorgio was a former professor of the history of science at MIT. He was uh, uh, a physicist. Uh, he studied both astronomy and philosophy, uh, taught at Harvard as a visiting professor. And he was really interested on where did science come from? What are the origins of science? And so that's what led him to study myth. And Hertha, uh, she was sort of on the, the softer sciences, uh, anthropology, ethnology, uh, at Goethe University on the Frankfurt uh, campus. And uh, they met in the 60s. And, and Goethe was studying the myths of uh, some of these ancient cultures to try to better understand uh, where they were coming from. And so the, the two of them met in the 60s and uh, Giorgio had already written a little book called The Origins of Science and, uh, and in that he was starting to question uh, you know if we had our histories exactly correct because he was finding a lot of knowledge of science uh, long before the Dark Ages, long before the Renaissance. And so you might think of these two as your, uh, you know, your John Anthony West and Robert Schock of the day. They were the first two uh, alternative historians, if you will. Today I'd like to uh, touch on four points. There's about 50 great points in the book, but I'll, I'll just talk about these four. One is that myth and folklore
specific language of yore. It's not...